Well, hi. <laughs> Welcome to this live stream. It's great to have you here. And I'm really, really glad to be here. Um, my name is Jonathan Faust, and we have a little meditation and talk. I'm kind of back live. I've been running a, a couple of recasts for the last many weeks. And we're going to talk about no self. What does that mean? I've been really interested in what does it mean to be awake? What does it mean to be enlightened? That's going to be the nature of, of what lies ahead. But before we launch, um, first of all, big thank yous. First of all, for you to be taking the time. And also just to say, um, really, really grateful for all that goes into bringing this to you. Uh, to our mindful movement teacher, to Rita Moran, thank you so much. To our mindful dialogue leader, to Ray Maniocchi. Um, if you want the full Monday night experience, you can... Join Rita for Mindful Movement at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. And after the talk at around 8.35, something like that, Eastern Standard, you can join Ray for a conversation around your practice, around the talk, anything that has to do with bringing mindfulness into your life. Those links are available on my website and on my Facebook page. And also just to say this would not happen without Glenn Harrison, our producer, uh, who helps to deliver this to you right now. And as well to the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for hosting this event. Um, thank you so much. I do have a mailing list. I send out a periodic update on uh, my talks and retreats and stuff like that. And my best photography that has uh, shown up over the last couple of months. And also just to say before we launch in, as always, uh, this is all offered freely. It's all offered in the spirit of dana or generosity. The whole idea is these teachings and practices are priceless. Therefore, there should be no charge. They should be offered generously and they're offered out of love. I love this stuff. If you feel inspired to help keep this going, thank you. I really, really appreciate it. Okay, all that being said, let's take a little bit of time to kind of gather some attention and arrive in presence. Generally, I find this happens through, through first, the first stage of gathering. You know, bring your attention back, resting in presence. It also involves beginning to take this seat of the witness, the, the observer of change, who you are as the one who's aware. And then finally, taking some time to simply relax into awareness itself. So if you, if you like, take some time now to move, to shift, to adjust your posture in any way that feels good. You might want to reach your arms up overhead, let your body sway a little bit from side to side. As you're ready, if you like, you can close your eyes. And let your attention move right into your breath. Just notice where you feel the breath right now. And you might like to slow down and deepen your breath. And just notice what happens as you bring your attention to your breathing. How it automatically begins to draw your awareness inward. There are times when you're aware of your breath where it may actually feel like you're getting more absorbed into the sensations. How intimately can you feel the breath right now? And you may find it helpful as a way of more and more intimately gathering in the here and now to explore conscious softening on the inside softening the muscles around the eyes. Feeling your head, just so the volume of your head, the forehead smooth. Over the next few exhalations, how much more could you soften all the muscles of your face? Face expressionless. Could you relax your lips?
Could you relax your tongue? Let your tongue fill your lower jaw and sense if you can simultaneously. Relax your jaw. As you relax and soften and feel, what do you notice on the inside? Then you relax and feel the weight of your arms, sensing down through your elbows. down through your wrists. Feeling from the inside, the palms, fingers and thumbs. Letting your attention move down into your belly, down deep in the belly, just maybe uh, an inch or two below your navel and in toward the center of the abdomen. Is it possible to relax or soften here? Can you feel from the inside the, the volume and the length of your legs? From the hips to the knees. The knees to the ankles. the tops of the feet and the toes, and the soles of the feet and the heels. And right now, as you sense the whole of the body from the crown of the head down to the soles of the feet, is there anything that could relax or soften or let go right now. Noticing again the, the movement of your breath, feeling the breath effortless, free flowing, Noticing where you feel the breath on the inside. Noticing the sounds around you, the real time vibrations of sound. And in your own way, just choosing breath or sound, maybe the feeling in the palms of the hands as well. Let this be your doorway back to the here and now. When you notice the mind wandering, feeling this breath, these sounds, or this felt sense of the hands.
And can you sense or imagine what it means to take the seat of the witness? To be the observer of everything that changes right now. Not judging, not grasping, not trying to make anything different. Just simply awake and relaxed. Is it possible to relax or soften even more right now? Is it possible to notice what's happening 360 degrees? Is it possible to, to let everything be exactly how it is? in this remaining minute or so, could you relax even more right now? And could you relax and at the same time sharpen your attention as to what is changing and who you are as the observer, the witness? Is it possible to let everything be exactly as it is? And now, if you would, imagine you could let go of all technique, any sense of doing, any sense of wanting anything different, just relax and feel. And deepening your breath now. Let your body move and stretch in any way that feels good to you. <clears throat> Taking your time for your transition here. Welcome back. I think it's safe to say that one fundamental truth is we're all getting older. And I was thinking about um, how my life has changed with age. And I think you can sum up life by your relationship to meetings. The first stage is I really want to be included in that meeting. The second stage is 
I really want to run that meeting. The third stage is how can I get out of this meeting? And the fourth stage is I am so done with meetings. <laughs> I can't tell if it's my shifting or evolving consciousness or if I'm just getting older, but but I actually feel less attached to my story. You know, my, my own personal narrative just seems less and less important as, as time goes by. I've been thinking a lot about this recently, particularly as I have the opportunity to work with different people and I get to see people in different stages of their lives. And it reminds me of the Vedas who talked about the stages of life. Uh, the first stage is being the good child. The next stage is being the good student. The next stage is being the good provider. And then when all your providing is done, the next stage is about awakening and service. I thought I got to bypass a lot of this when I moved into an ashram and took renunciation vows and all of that stuff. I got, got to go right to the awakening and service part. <laughs> that lasted for a while, but you know, part of my personal narrative is that all melted down and I had to find a way to earn my way in the world. Fortunately, I was able to earn my way in the world by doing what I love. But this like awakening and service thing, like that stage continues to be kind of center stage for me. And I think as we age, and maybe for you as you have aged, have you noticed this becoming more front and center? You know, what does it mean to be awake? What does it mean to be enlightened? And if you really explore what it means to be awake, and you look to some of the core teachings and for looking through the lens of Buddhist psychology, it's oftentimes described as the absence of. And many traditions talk about how the awakened state is the absence of certain characteristics. Through this lens of Buddhist psychology, you could say it's the absence of greed, the absence of hatred, and the absence of delusion. These are considered kind of the three poisons of the mind. You are not awake when you are caught in, in never-ending desire. You are not awake when you are caught in anger, hatred, ill will, aversion. You are not awake when you're believing some things are true when they're not, or not believing some things true are when they are. And, and there's another quality, which is you're not awake when you are attached to your sense of self when you're attached to your narrative, to your story. And this is such a juicy topic, and I'd love to dive into this. And I thought, why not start with this whole idea of, of the self and the ego? So I'd like to talk a little bit and share with you about, as I usually do, kind of four things. First is this, this process of the dissolution of ego. The second is how, as your ego begins to become more porous, how there is this natural sort of spontaneous arising of interconnectedness, the, the awakening to interconnectedness. And with that third, the natural spontaneous arising of compassion and empathy. And with that, a greater and greater degree of freedom from suffering. So this whole dissolution of ego thing, so, so interesting. Uh, you may know that we just got a puppy. And um, the first question was, what are we going to call her? So she's going to be a little dog. And for some reason, I thought it was hilarious to name a little dog Veronique. Um, so we shortened it to Nikki. So formal name is Veronique, and uh, Nikki is uh, the, uh, <laughs> the familiar name, if you will. And it's interesting, because when you get a puppy, they have no clue um, who and what they are. So you start to train the puppy to recognize their name. You know, so you say the name, you give it a little reward. And the reward is either a little treat or just some affection, attention, and love. 
And then you kind of move on to getting eye contact, you know, the name, eye contact, and reward. And over time, the puppy starts to recognize her name. The name and the eye contact. And now, when you say, hey, Nikki, chances are, depending on her level of distraction, she'll turn and she'll respond. She knows her name. Same thing with you. <laughs> when you came into this world, you were this just nameless little blob of uh, nerve endings. People started calling you something, and after a while, it's like, are you talking to me? Oh, I'm a me. And you become more aware of your body. You become more aware of your mind. You become more aware of your personality and your behaviors, and your, your sense of self begins to become more coalesced. One of the first things we relate to is this biological flesh unit that you're living, the body. We become conscious of our body and then, and then we become usually self-conscious of our body. Our body becomes part of our, our image and we become attached to that image. And for me, I have an older brother who, uh, who in high school was 6'4", 210 pounds, uh, played varsity basketball. He set records in shot put and javelin, four years older than me. So when I show up, my brother was 6'4", and I was 6'5". My brother weighed 210 pounds. I weighed 150 pounds. <laughs> and they were waiting for me to flesh out and turn into my brother. So there I am, 6'5", 150, 155 pounds, absolute, as ectomorphic as you can possibly get. And in track and field, they put me on shot put and javelin. And I remember <laughs> working out with these guys. And there'd be these, just these big monster, you know, um, mesomorph guys with a shot put, you know, and they, they'd have the shot put and, and they would, They'd throw the shot put. It'd be this thunk, you know. And next guy would come up, thunk, and it was my turn. It'd be like uh, thunk. <laughs> it was just so, so pathetic. I can laugh about it now. I wasn't laughing about it then. My my ego was so wrapped up in and how I looked, how I was falling short. Um, I've always been a hard gainer. I've never been able to put on weight. I was never able to achieve that image that I wanted of being able to uh, compete with my, my older brother. And I realized that uh, over years that because, you know, 6'5", 150 pounds, um, or 155, whatever, I think I never, I never got beyond 165 by the time I graduated from high school. If anything kind of fit, I would buy it. And at some point, um, I realized my closet was full of ill-fitting clothes and colors I, I hated. Um, now, paradoxically, um, and I have I, I do weigh a little more than 150 now. Um, paradoxically, uh, tall, skinny body now is actually uh, desirable. So uh, um, it's actually, it's a good thing. So I, I, I like the body I have, but I had to make peace with my body. This is what I got. These are the, these are the cards I was dealt. Uh, I had one experience, which was very, very interesting. I met my great, great uncle, um, Long John Lewis. Um, I was 16, he was 86. And we were the same height, same color eyes, same body type. And it was looking into a mirror, like me in 60 years. And uh, I was like, oh, okay. And he seemed like a pretty happy guy. And that helped me kind of reframe things a little bit. But a big part of my journey was making peace with an attachment to something I wanted that I didn't have. And that's what this is all about. It's about examining our attachments and coming into contact with reality. When we explore the nature of karma, of cause and effect, it's so important to recognize you are the product of karma. 
You're the product of causes and conditions. And what it goes on to say is you're also the creator of your karma. That your actions, your thoughts, speech, and actions today create your future. But so often we have a deep disquiet about the cards that we were dealt. So if we could, if you don't mind, we'll, take, we'll do a short reflection, if you like. If you like, you can close your eyes. Please don't if you're driving. You might take three slow, smooth breaths. Notice if you could soften or relax from the breath moving out. And just take a moment to sense this, this physical body that you are inhabiting right now. And you might reflect on the parts that are working well, uh, the parts of your body that are not working so well. And just honoring that this is the body that you have been given. Whatever the genetic lottery may be, <clears throat> this is what you have, what you have called. And you might take a moment to kind of expand beyond this, just to sense the cards that you've been dealt in this life. Taking a moment to acknowledge your parents or your primary caretakers. Sensing their influence on you. Sensing your family, your your placement if you're the only child or where you where you rate in terms of your birth first second third fourth or beyond just sensing what impact did that have on your conditioning your ancestry your economic status, the schools you went to, the friends that you had in life. Just sensing all that has gone into creating who you are. And just sensing again the breath and just acknowledging the wounds, the challenges that you've had in life. So sensing what has most grown you. And taking a moment to reflect on the relationship between the challenges and the wounds in your life and how they may be related to the gifts that you bring forward. And is it possible to acknowledge the cards you have been dealt and to say, thank you, I'll work with this. And if you like, you can deepen your breath. You can open your eyes. There have been times in my life where it has been very helpful to say, okay, this is what I'm working with. And what this starts to demonstrate is there, <clears throat> there are two selves, if you wish. There is the self that is the product of conditioning. All the influences that have shaped your personality, your behaviors, your habits. And there is a self that is unconditioned. So if you think about brushing your teeth, looking in the mirror when you were six, and imagine brushing your teeth now, this is assuming you're not six, you may get a sense of how much the body has aged since then. But here's the question, is the self looking through your eyeballs any different 
than the self that was brushing your teeth when you were six years old. Unless we pause and really look closely, we live our entire life through the lens of the conditioned self. And you live your life bound by your likes and your dislikes and your preferences. And maybe you have noticed that as people age, the list of their likes and dislikes and preferences gets longer and longer and longer and the bandwidth of comfort, that, that bandwidth of, of ease gets really, really narrow. And this is where mindfulness comes in. This is where pausing and examining your likes and dislikes can create a greater sense of freedom. So whether you have stepped into mindfulness or meditation as a path of stress reduction or as a path of waking up, you are on this journey of dissolution of this preference-based self. Sin Sing Ming summed it up beautifully, the third Zen patriarch, when he said, life is not difficult for those who have no preferences. So how do we remember this? This becomes the question, how do we remember? And there are moments, I am sure, in your life <clears throat> where you have felt this conditioned self relax. And that conditioned self has gotten a little more porous. What happens when that self begins to soften? As you know, I, or maybe you don't know, <laughs> but if you listen to me, I tend to talk about one of my great passions, which is being out in nature paddling on, on the water. <clears throat> and when I paddle here on the Potomac, I paddle really, really hard upstream. And then at some point I turn around and I let the current take me back. And either I paddle with the current or I just simply go with the flow and I kind of do an open-eyed meditation. And a while back, as I was sort of like floating back, I had this, this question just sort of like popped in, like, what if I'm already dead? What if I'm just awareness? And it, it was kind of a strange thing to ask myself, but a fascinating thing happened to me that I just sort of sensed as I was just awareness floating down the river. I noticed how life went on and how everything was happening by itself. Like there's a deer swimming across the river. There's some mergansers fighting. There's a murmuration of cowbirds. There's a fish jumping. And something almost ecstatic began to arise for me, this sense of how the world goes on without me having to do anything as simply just awareness of what is. There was this sense of expansion and inclusion and paradoxically a sense of belonging. The Buddha famously allegedly said, Nothing whatsoever is to be clung to as I or mine. And what I love about that aphorism, if you, if you track that, nothing whatsoever is to be clung to as I or mine, it's this direct little portal into what it means to be this sense of the unconditioned self, which points toward awake awareness itself. So if you don't mind, I'd like to lead another short inquiry. One of my kind of favorite inquiries is exploring the sounds and relationship to sounds. If you like, you can close your eyes. And if you would, take three slow and smooth breaths. 
and let yourself soften and relax on the inside. On the out breath, can you cultivate a sense of just receiving the moment? Relaxing and receiving. And let your attention open to, to identify all the sounds that are happening 360 degrees around you right now. Now you'll notice that there is a listening through, through the mind, which will seek to identify the sound, identify the location and determine whether it will kill you or not. It's a helpful way of listening in the world. But there's another way of listening that's referred to in some traditions as bare attention. That is listening without a story without a narrative, just listening and feeling the vibrations of the sounds. This sound meditation can reveal what are referred to as three characteristics of reality. The first is impermanence. Just notice now how the sounds are changing. The second characteristic has to do with what's called dukkha or suffering. And if you notice, if you focus on just one sound, you'll lose awareness of the other sounds. So when you fixate your attention, you lose a sense of the whole. It's like picking out one instrument in an orchestra. The third characteristic is that these sounds are not personal. They are beyond your control. And taking the next few moments just to sense how the sounds are changing. That when you fixate your attention, you lose awareness of all the other sounds and how the sounds are utterly beyond your control. Who are you in this awareness? And now in the next minute, is it possible to expand your awareness beyond the sounds to sensations and thoughts and to different states? Can you sense how your experience is imbued with constant change? That when you attach your awareness to one thing, you lose awareness of everything else and how your experience is happening all by itself without you having to do a single thing. Taking the next few breaths to explore and sense this.
If you like, you can deepen your breath. If you like, you can open your eyes. <clears throat> this exploration of the conditioned self and the unconditioned self brings us into a deeper sense of, or deeper perception of reality. And back to being on the river, I see a lot of reality on the river. <laughs> kind of the joy of lots of babies in the spring, just kind of the joy associated with with life itself and, and lots of death. Sickly animals. Um, last spring, I just explored a dead beaver that was caught in some tree roots. I found an owl that was caught in fishing line and had to be euthanized and Everything's eating, everything's eating everything else out there. There's a lot of reality, but when our sense of self and other begins to dissolve, that dissolution can lead to a deep sense of interconnection with all beings. When you realize the self ultimately is not separate. And that can open up a deep sense of compassion because the suffering others is no longer separate from our own suffering. So it's one thing to experience this sense of interconnectedness with nature and an environment, but where it really gets more real and personal is in our relationships. And you know that feeling when you're with someone and you feel a sense of separation and, and you can do that role reverse when you can sense and feel what they're feeling, when you feel like someone senses and feels like they really get you, that amazing experience of connection where, where separation falls away and this presence arises, it's a wonderful feeling, that sense of interconnectedness. But what's so paradoxical, of course, is when we feel that sense of interconnectedness, we want more of it and then we get attached and then we become preference based and then we begin to shut it down. So how do we cultivate that sense of prefereceless awareness in relationship? More to talk about. <laughs> we'll cover that one and solve that one soon. <laughs> So when the sense of the conditioned self begins to fall away, there is this sense of interconnectedness and with it, compassion and empathy start to flow. So a little story on this one. My dad, who's now passed about 10 years, was, was very active politically. He was a World War II vet in one of the most active and decorated regiments in Europe. He'd been wounded twice. He'd been missing in action. He received commendations for bravery. His best friends died in front of him. Um, the second time he was wounded and patched up, he was sent to Buchenwald after the uh, concentration camp was liberated. He saw horrible, horrible things. And one of the ways he worked out of his own issues and his own PTSD was to be part of avoiding this happening again. He became a Quaker, became politically active. He, he counseled young men about alternative service in the Vietnam War. He did lobbying in Washington. And when he retired, he, he moved to Maine. And he got involved with a kind of a social social active, socially active group in social justice. And we'd have a conversation every week and, and he started talking very passionately about LGBTQ rights in Maine and lobbying and all this stuff. And he had never mentioned anything about LGBTQ populations ever. And I asked him, why, why are you so adamant about this now? What, where's the passion? He said, well, there's some people I've gotten to know in my, in my social justice group who are LGBTQ, and it's, it's just not right the way they're being treated. I was so struck 
by that by his capacity in, in friendships that he was cultivating to connect and to empathize, to drop a personal narrative and, and respond. One of the most powerful practices there is, for me anyway, is that when I am struggling to ask myself how many other people are experiencing this right now. When I, mean, I have a migraine and I've tried all my techniques for avoiding the pain and I have to go into, okay, these are the cards I've been dealt. How many other people are feeling this right now? Now, an interesting thing occurs for me, the pain doesn't go away, but wow, does the frame get big. When I looked it up, how many people on the planet at any given moment are experiencing migraine, I am not alone. And when my dad died, how many people have lost their fathers? The frame gets so big, just gets so big. I'd like to lead another short reflection. If you would, and again, you can close your eyes. Taking three slow breaths again. And if you would bring into mind uh, just a difficult moment in the last day or two, a moment of frustration, of challenge, of difficulty. And take a few breaths as you let yourself settle on, on that feeling inside. That feeling of difficulty, of stress. And just saying hello to it. And you might just inquire, how many people in this planet right now may be feeling this feeling? And if you would, now bring into mind a, a recent, I'm going to call it a magic moment. <laughs> a moment when you felt a sense of connection, a sense of grace, a sense of gratitude, a sense of appreciation. And, and take your time, take some breaths, and let the mind kind of settle on a memory of, of a magic moment. Gratitude, appreciation, grace, kindness, generosity. when you have a sense of it, how many people on this planet are feeling this? And just sense for yourself in this very short inquiry, when you ask yourself this question, how many people are feeling this right now? What, what shifts inside? And if you like, you can deepen your breath. If you like, you can open your eyes. The Tonglen practice is essentially just saying to yourself, other people feel this too. And when you move into that sense of other people feel this too, it becomes a very profound inquiry. Described sometimes as seeing self in other and other in self. I practice this a lot when I first uh, met my wonderful wife's son, who was 19 years old and was a 19 year old. And whenever I get frustrated, I would just ask myself, how have I done that? And of course, I certainly had, and it opened up a sense of connection. So 
selflessness is connected to enlightenment because it's connected to a deep sense of compassion and empathy. And when the boundaries between yourself and others are blurred, there's this natural and kind of spontaneous inclination to respond to the suffering with kindness and with compassion. And with this sickness of polarization in our culture right now, I think maybe this is our deepest work to, to empathize. It's a societal issue, and of course, it's a personal issue. You know, that sense of, you know, if I were you and that happened to me, I'd feel exactly the same way. The capacity to drop your own conditioned sense of self and, and role reverse. So much healing occurs when we can do that. When we feel separate, we explore every way we can kind of self-soothe and we become very attached to our point of view. So the question is, how do we, how do we make this shift? The sense of, of enlightenment, if you will, your true nature, awake awareness, bodhicitta, self-realization, insight, timeless wisdom, liberation, nirvana. These, this experience of the unconditioned self, how do we realize this? Does it come through, through great effort? It's a very interesting exploration. Does it come through focus? Does it come through adding things? What if it's more about letting go? As one great non-dual teacher said, no one ever got enlightened by adding anything. So perhaps it's a practice of letting go, of letting go of our attachments, letting go of our aversions, letting go of every point of view that is out of alignment with reality, letting go of anything you're holding on to. One of my favorite little meditations, I've, I've led this one before, but it gives us this glimpse of moving from this tightly bound sense of self to the unconditioned self. If you'd like, again, you can close your eyes. You might take a, a few slow breaths. And as you feel the breath, you might explore those following phrases and you can repeat these phrases internally or just feel the phrases as they resonate in your awareness. Again, you're feeling the breath right now. The first phrase, I am sitting here breathing. And dropping the last word, I am sitting here. I am sitting. I am. I. And now drop the I. If you like, you can gently deepen the breath, open the eyes, if your eyes were closed. This idea of a separate self, the, the, the conditioned self, is often associated with attachment and aversion and this cycle of craving, wanting, and suffering. 
when you transcend a sense of the separate self, you can begin to tap into a sense of inner peace, a sense of contentment. And ultimately, what's referred to as liberation from suffering. There's so much more to say in this topic. But there's something here about remembering that there are two selves. Who you are is the conditioned self. You are the product of your conditioning. Everything born out of causes and conditions has, has shaped your perspective, your habits, your beliefs. And who you are is this unconditioned self, unconditioned awareness, pure, vibrant, alive, awake awareness. It's been said there are two paths. One is the path of self-improvement. It's a noble path. It's about being a better listener, being a better partner, being a more concentrated meditator, being a more focused person, being a more altruistic person, being a more efficient person. The other path is a path of self-realization. It's about again and again bringing your attention to what is this conditioned self? Who are you in the absence of conditioning? Who are you in the absence of desire? It's a really juicy inquiry. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, we're going to explore a little more, if you're interested, around who you are in the absence of desire, who you are in the absence of hatred, who you are in the absence of confusion, and how do we cultivate more and more this sense of, of the unconditioned, pure light of awareness that you really are. Let's take just a few moments before we close. If you like, you can close both your eyes. Slow down your breath just for a few moments. And just in your own way, as you open your attention to all the senses, sounds, breath, sense of touch, and sensing who you are as the one who is aware. You might, in these final moments, wish yourself well in your journey. Imagine your path opening with greater ease, guided from, from deep within by an awakened heart and mind. And as you wish yourself well, imagine you could spread that out in all directions like a star in the night sky. May all beings awaken. May all beings feel free from stress and know their true nature. Thank you so much for your time and attention. May you and your conditioned self have a wonderful time. I look forward to being with you again soon.